Welcome to the world of Cadillac and to your exciting new 1987 Cimarron. And congratulations. Cadillac is confident you'll enjoy this functional, efficient, fun-to-drive, responsive road car. Truly the Cadillac of sport sedans, with more value than ever in 1987. This audio cassette, one of many items included in the Cadillac Gold Key Delivery System, is part of our Gold Key Delivery commitment to ensure that your new Cimarron meets your every expectation. As you will appreciate, there are many features and benefits of your new Cimarron. Please listen to this entire audio tape as we describe some of them and how they operate. To help you keep your new Cimarron in top operating condition, we will also review recommended maintenance schedules and point out the highlights of your 1987 Cimarron warranty. This will help you protect your investment and increase your overall satisfaction. Two kinds of people bought Cimarrons. Number one, widows. My name is Janet Biddle. Oh, my late husband, Jerome, he, he passed away, you know, eight years ago, and... Oh, I'm sad to hear that. Uh, we here at Conkleman, Chevrolet, Cadillac, and Kia understand how important family is to... He was a lieutenant commander, but he didn't really talk about his work all that much. I mean, he had a lot of friends who just, you know... They like to sit and look at the leaves and, oh, I, I don't know what kind of car. Well, well, our family, we always drove Cadillacs. And, uh -huh. and when Jerome passed away, I, I prayed to God that, uh -huh. we, uh, that he would show us the right owner for our house. And, you know, that person just showed up one day. Oh, that's nice. Anyway, Jerome always liked Cadillacs, so we always drove Cadillacs. So going back when we met at the Dusselfink and uh -huh. all that might have been 1959 because uh -huh. he got back. He stayed overseas a little bit after the war, you know. Would Jerome like you to keep driving a Cadillac? Oh, yeah. It's just I don't really need anything that big. Well, Janet Biddle, I think you'll love the Cimarron. And number two, the other people who bought Cimarrons were marks, really, fools, rubes, affluenza-ridden peasants thirsty to drink from life's pimp cup, headline-only reading, horoscope-weighing, daily number-playing locals. Disgruntled, failure-to-launch sidewalk gazers who always have an I got screwed story ready to tell you. And when you don't want to hear that, they have a harangue about how everybody else is doing it wrong. I need to feel the I demand. They're all ruining it. I, I buy discount meats. Give me the ends from the Lebanon baloney. Ever see Debbie does Dallas? I'm here to wheel and deal. I peel my grapes. Coke is it. And then this dealership looky-loo vomits up half a jar of Miller's hot bologna, all the while self-professing moral authority over everybody who had a better life than he. So the salesman, upon seeing this, switches gears to manipulate the customer's needs like Theseus in the labyrinth, getting all around the corners to find the customer's jealous heart and then get the customer to buy a pile of cafeteria diarrhea with gold glitter all over it. Let's go back to the tape. Simply pull the shoulder belt out far enough so that when you let it go, it will return snugly to your chest. Then pull down on the shoulder belt the least amount needed to ease pressure, no more than an inch, and let go. The shoulder belt ratchet will hold the belt at that position, creating a comfortable safety belt fit. To use your Cimarron standard remote control trunk release, the ignition has to be on. Then simply push the yellow release button located inside the glove box door opening. The turn signal lever on the left of the steering column performs several functions. 
Move the lever partway up or down, and you have momentary lane change signaling. Regular turn signals are operated by moving the lever up or down until it locks into place. I could listen to this tape all day, honestly. Oh, and happy belated birthday, Roman. I forgot to say anything, but I'm saying it now. The year is 1987. The first Final Fantasy was released. The GIF was invented. That is graphic interchange format. GIF. <clears throat> the biggest movie of the year was Three Men and a Baby. Spuds McKenzie helped Budweiser sell beer, Chrysler bought AMC, Bacon was $1.69 a pound, and Cadillac released the latest, the latest example in their scale model of hopelessness called the Cimarron. It's the car Motor Trend considers one of the worst ever made, but even calling it a car that was made is giving it more credit than it deserves. Happy belated birthday, Roman! Cadillac product planners wanted a smaller Cadillac Seville, since it sold strongest among Americans just searching for a smaller sedan, but wanted that big car feel. But what we ended up with was what was... I mean, it's a rebadged Chevy Cavalier. You can see it just looking at it. It, had a, it has an overwhelming air of fake luxury, like a landlord complaining about how being a landlord doesn't pay what it used to. Collecting your check with his brought worse fingers turning purple from too many rings and not enough epidermal real estate. Cadillac wanted to secure the future of their luxury identity, but instead created a Cavalier that's behind on his Yacht Club membership dues. Cadillac Cimarron. A car for cruising down the road to success. Except the road to success is paid by PennDOT. Built on the J platform, which introduced front-wheel drive to its compact models, the Cimarron was more expensive, but with fewer differences from other J cars besides price point. Happy burrito birthday, Roman. It was a five-alarm dumpster fire in the making, almost from the word go. This is because the Cimarron had one of the shortest development cycles in automotive history. It was originally scheduled to be released in the late, mid, like mid to late 80s. That's when they wanted it to come out. But that was, oh, hurry up. It was instead released all the way back in 1981 to match the release of other cars on the J platform, like the Cavalier, the Buick Skyhawk, and the Pontiac Sunbird. To put it into perspective, J-Cars entered the planning stages back in 1976 for, for Chevrolet and Pontiac brands before the decision was made to add Buick and Oldsmobile to the lineup, to the lineup of brands to get a J-Car. Those vehicles had years of lead time, so by the time those cars were being prepped for the 1982 launch, they were, they were ready. But this last-minute decision to add Cadillac to the mix meant production was scrambling to catch up. GM's president warned Cadillac GM Ed Kennard that he was cutting it too close, saying, quote, Ed, you don't have time to turn the J-Car into a Cadillac. Kennard had pushed for the brand's admission into the J-Car platform and was accepted with little more than a year remaining to get the car out for the summer of 1981 as a 1982 model which meant that there was no time for adjustments to separate or distinguish the Cimarron in any meaningful way. Slapping Cadillac badges on a Cavalier wasn't enough to earn it the right to carry the Cadillac name. In short, the Cadillac prestige didn't transfer. And frankly, $12,000 was too steep for a recession, as that comes out to nearly $40,000 today. If this car were sold today, this would have been a forty grand car. The average price for a new car in 1987 was $10,300. Now, when you go to the front lines back in 1982, salespeople got a stern talking to in the early days if they referred to it as a Cadillac Cimarron. You had to call it The Cimarron or The Cimarron by Cadillac. It originally didn't even have its name anywhere on the car. The tagline was, a new kind of Cadillac for a new kind of Cadillac owner. I'm guessing this is someone who is willing to pay sticker price without asking any questions. The kind of Cadillac owner who's allergic to negotiation. But by 1983, the company had given up on their pretentiousness and just called it the Cadillac Cimarron, which is just as well, since the leather was probably the most Cadillac thing about it. Humpy Borg Day, Roman. Now, what Cadillac was thinking was... They wanted to target potential BMW 3 Series buyers. 
a 3 Series, an E30 from 1987. Amazing. Fantastic. Worth something today. The luxury, and I will say on some levels an E30 can be luxury, is all in the suspension and the ride and the way the steering is tight. And they built a 3 Series from the 80s. You can tell BMW cared about people. And that's why they hold their value. This thing is still dirt cheap. No one wants Cimarron's. Cadillac did nothing to further differentiate it from the Cavalier, apart from badges. And yes, the leather. Sure, it's not the first experiment with badge engineering, and it's far from the last. But badge engineering is already like a chicken pox party. We're just spreading the disease around, trying to inoculate against any more bland, badge-engineered sedans. Except sometimes the infection doesn't take, and the brand pays for it down the line in the form of something far worse. The Cimarron. It's automotive shingles. This issue was further complicated by the war between Cadillac general manager John Grettenberger and the head of the new Buick Oldsmobile Cadillac group, Bill Hogland. Hogland felt the Cimarron was hurting Cadillac's bottom line among potential luxury brand customers, while Grettenberger felt that while the Cimarron was underperforming, the brand badly needed the five-figure annual sales the Cimarron offered to prop up from the bottom line. Horgle Borgle Day, Roman. But Hogland thought Cadillac and Buick were potentially cannibalizing each other's sales in addition to their funding, since Buick was helping fund Cadillac's restyling efforts for the Eldorado and the DeVille for 1988 and 1989, respectively. Grettenberger eventually lost the battle, and the Cimarron would only last another year past this model. It would get better toward the end, replacing plastic with sheet metal, and a better V6 option, but it was still too expensive for what buyers were looking to pay for a rebadged Chevy. That equivalent of a $40,000 price point is really hard to swallow. Mm, 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 mm. It's, it's okay, baby. I ate a lot of pineapple. So what do you get in a Cimarron? Well, you get a 2.8 liter multi-port fuel injection LB6 V6, part of GM's family of 60 degree V6 engines. It makes, you ready for this? 125 horsepower and 160 pound feet of torque. As far as fuel economy goes, 20 city, 26 highway. For his part, the owner Steve fixed the overflow tank and added a new gas tank. For him, he finds this to be the perfect cheap cruiser in 2022. It's still got a lot of life in it. Has about 74,000 miles on the odometer, and he purchased it back when it had 71,000. The rear passenger side window sticks, and you only get lap belts in the rear of the car. But you do get power windows, so that's something. Let's go back to the tape cassette. To prevent engine damage, do not run the engine in the red area of the tachometer. The voltmeter is located to the lower right of the tachometer. The voltmeter should read between 11 and 16 volts. If not, the charging system requires attention. If your Cimarron is equipped with a manual transmission, there's an amber upshift reminder light in the lower center of the speedometer. It will illuminate to indicate the best time to shift gears for optimum fuel economy. If your Cadillac Cimarron is equipped with the available Twilight Sentinel, you can activate the system by keeping the headlamp control knob pushed all the way in and rotating the dial from off toward max. The system will then automatically turn your headlamps on when it is dark outside and off when it is light. This feature allows the lights to remain on for a short period once the ignition is turned off. You can adjust this exit time delay to a maximum of three minutes or a minimum of a few seconds by rotating the dial between the off and max positions. With Twilight Sentinel, you can set the system and may never need to touch the headlamp controls again unless you want to change the delay setting. The first year of sales in 1982 was a little under 26,000 units. The final year in 1998, they only sold about 6,500 of these things. I mean, why pick a Cimarron as your weekend cruiser when you can go play Microsoft Flight Simulator with a fan on and get the same experience? 
Between Cadillac's disastrous V8 6.4 engine and the reliance on Dieselgate as, as a hedge against CAFE standards, Cadillac was unbirthing their prestige here in the 1980s, sending it back up the cooter chute to think about what it's done. Returning the company to an unglamorous period of reputational gestation. Yes, diesels worked for a little while in the 1980s, but it was all over once they started cutting corners and the engine started failing. A class action lawsuit saw General Motors paying nearly 80% of replacement costs for each engine, to the point where Cadillac was soured on passenger diesels for decades afterwards. And the Cimarron did nothing to rebuild Cadillac's reputation. Hip hop adopting the Escalade did more for Cadillac than the Cimarron. But despite being one of of the worst cars of all time, you can see how it... No. This would have never even spoken to a younger generation, even in the 80s. Even for whom the late 80s is a glorious novelty. Like an American traveling to an English-speaking foreign country for the first time, it's different, but not so wildly different as to be intimidating. I suppose there's a comfort for dubious familiarity. It's kind of like what you know, but more charming by the virtue of its differences. Steve enjoys this car as a cruiser, with a touch of uniqueness that you don't really see around here. Or anywhere. You can tell his love for the car is genuine, so you can't fault him. I can enjoy this car as a passing curiosity, but I would never want to own one of these things. I look at 80s Cadillacs like I look at boats. Or light aircraft. The best plane is somebody else's. Even if this car is not for us, you have to encourage a reverence for the past whenever you can. But you also have to be honest. And your glasses will never spot the truth unless you swap out the rose-colored lenses.